morning. How are you? Imagine if you started every morning like this. <laughs> Imagine if you started every day thinking about doing something no human had ever done before. Doing something that everyone around you, no matter how smart they would, said was pure lunacy. And every day you practiced, you developed equipment, you refined your techniques, you tested the limits, you took on more risks, so that when you got to the world that was unknown, it was actually not unknown at all. It was very familiar to you. Well, you'd be like Felix here, the man who jumped from space to Earth, the man who did the impossible. I want to share with you a few thoughts today about something we did, maybe not as courageous as this, but on how we in the media took on the world that was not known what we've learned from it, and hopefully what you might learn from that as well. This is the, is the world as we knew it, back in, way back in 1980, when I was around the age that maybe some of you here today are. This is the world that we knew. In those days, and we're not talking centuries ago, I'm not that old, uh, in those days, if you wanted to know what was going on in the world, you had three choices. You could watch TV, yes, we had TV back then, you could listen to the radio or you could read a newspaper. And then along came something called the internet and it shattered everything. And people said, you're doomed, it's over. You've been fragmented, there's no way to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And we thought, we're gonna disagree. We're gonna disagree and we're going to take on the world that we don't know and we're gonna do that by also fighting in the world that we do know. We reimagined the newspaper to be a vibrant, colorful, engaging daily publication. And we threw everything we could into digital media. And today we have twice as many digital readers at the Globe and Mail than we do in print. And hundreds of thousands of more followers on social media through Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, LinkedIn. Our audience is growing by the day, by the week, in the world that we once did not know. We did this by sticking true to three questions. And these are the three questions I want to challenge you with today. First and foremost is to check your compass. Do you know where you are? Where are we today? Well, I'm not that stupid, despite what my children might tell you. We're at Havergal College. I get that. I saw the sign on the way in. But is that really where we are? Because I might have said, we're actually here. That's us in 1980 as seen from the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it was hurtling past uh, Neptune, I believe it was, on its way out of our solar system. We're on this little rock. Others might say, no, you're actually there. That's your solar system. And there's 400 billion of them in the Milky Way. And someone else might say, you know what? You're actually there. That's the Milky Way. And there's 100 billion like them. That's perspective. When you check your compass and rethink your perspective, it allows you to see new things. I think that's uh, what helped Felix make that, uh, make that great jump. A few weeks ago, I got to uh, change my perspective with something called zero gravity. You go out in an, air, in an airplane, this was uh, over the f desert outside Phoenix, and it's just like a roller coaster. You go up and down, and you know on the Leviathan at uh, Wonderland, when you go over one of those arcs, you go up in the air and hang there for half a second, well, an airplane goes up from 20,000 feet to 30,000 feet, straight up, arcs straight down, does that a dozen times, and each time it arcs, for about 30 seconds, you float in the air. Gravity is taken away from you. And when gravity is taken away from you, it's very disorienting. A friend of mine, his cell phone came out of his pocket and he couldn't <laughs> grab it as it, uh, as it floated away. And you're challenged with question number two, which is, is that a problem when your cell phone is floating away, or a great opportunity? because we're surrounded by opportunities. And I want to challenge the young people here today to think every time they hear the word problem, they should hear the word opportunity. We live in a world of problems. We're told about a crisis of water. The world has a water crisis, when in fact, the world has more water than it knows what to do with. We have an opportunity to figure out what to do with all that water. Probably our knowledge of water could fit inside that little glass next to the ocean. The same with cars. People say there's a terrible traffic problem out there. The people at Google look at this picture and they say, that's not a problem. The problem isn't the cars. The problem is the fuel that drives the cars and the drivers who get so enraged sitting in, uh, in traffic like this. So let's not take away cars. 
let's create a battery-powered driverless car. And by the time the youngest people at Havergal are old enough to drive, they're actually not going to be, uh, they're not going to drive themselves to school. A computerized car will drive them and they can sit in the front seat watching their class probably on, uh, on Wi-Fi. The problem isn't the car, the problem is us, the drivers, and the fuel. Google has seen that as an opportunity. The third question is what are you not seeing? And this is a great question to ask with your eyes closed. Because when your eyes are closed, it's much harder to hear the word no. Let me take you back to 1996. I figured that was a year when probably many students here today were, uh, were born or in cribs. Bill Clinton was president. Jerry Maguire, I had to look this up, was the uh, best-selling film. And that's what a web page looked like in 1996. Seems ancient now. I was living in India at the time, and a young fellow named Craig Kielberger came to visit. And he had a simple message. He was 12 years old at the time. Three words, free the children. And Craig met with a lot of us adults who had a lot more experience and supposedly had more wisdom. And we said, you know what, Craig? These kids need to work. That's how they help their families. And he begged to differ. He had closed his eyes and didn't hear the word no. And he said, these kids can actually help their families more if they stay in school. And we need to find ways, here's an opportunity, to keep them in school. Last month, Craig invited me to Wee Day. He has 20,000 people in the Air Canada Center people who don't hear the word no. And he does that a dozen times across Canada and raises tens of millions of dollars for kids like that because he did not hear the word no. Arianna Huffington, you may have heard of her. In 1996, she was running a, or she was part of a fringe radio and cable TV program because all the big networks said she was too radical to be on their programs. Arianna begged to differ, but rather than play their game, she launched her own product, the Huffington Post, you may have heard of that as well. It's now a TV network as well as an online newspaper, more influential, most would argue, than all the networks who turned her down in 1996. Naguib Sawaris, an Egyptian businessman, pushing phones in the 1990s, heard no from a lot of countries, including Canada. We didn't want him. Other countries didn't want him. So we turned to the market he knew best, which was Africa, because no one else was in Africa pushing phones. And today, Today, Africa is the hottest mobile phone market in the world. 750 million cell phones in Africa, more than any other market outside of Asia, uh, because people like Sawiris refused to hear the word no. They closed their eyes, and they imagined what the rest of us could not see. When you check your perspective, when you question where are we, rather than hearing the word problem, when you see opportunity, and when you close your eyes and ask what's possible, it's amazing what you can do. I'll leave you with a thought about gravity. Not the gravity of physics, but the gravity of our minds. The gravity that holds us back from the world of the unknown. Dare to challenge gravity. Dare to float free. We are really just in the beginning of the most innovative century humanity has ever known. A decade into it, we've got things like mobile video, TED Talks, robotic surgery, driverless cars, things that did not exist a decade ago. Think of what all of you can do with a century ahead when you test the limits. Thank you very much.